which you need vision based information so it's hard to get this from text and these are uh, images from microscopes so just to give you three examples of where these models would perform poorly and you can see here both the <coughs> these axes is the few shot performance with different number of labeled training examples so in this case we we train I think a linear layer Yes, we train it in a linear layer on top uh, and the purple curve corresponds to how this, the model having more and more data approaches asymptotically the performance to having all the data and you can see that even with zero shot is very clear it has a similar performance as to having four labeled examples per class for ImageNet which means that this type of zero shot uh, classification is really, really good, even though you don't train anything on top. Okay, and last, <laughs> so in the beginning of the presentation, I presented the reset scores, and here it's the zero shot clip scores, and you can see that the the big advantage is the robustness of this model. So it's it's not all about classifying images from the validation set of ImageNet but also learning abstract, more abstract concepts uh, so you can see for example this the last three rows correspond to data sets where the, the performance gap is uh, quite enormous and uh, on the left side it's, uh, this is like a more qualitative illustration for some specific examples and this is a more principled quantitative approach so these are I will draw it on the board So this is the image that, uh, validation accuracy and this is the accuracy and this is the average uh, accuracy over these uh, six or seven yeah, over these seven distribution shifts, so two data sets that have a significantly different distribution from ImageNet. Um, so let's say this is the so this is the ideal behavior where the model is not influenced by the fact that you change the distribution; it has exactly the same accuracy. So y equals x it means. If the model has 80% accuracy on ImageNet, it would still have, it would be classified all these bananas and dogs and cats with 80% accuracy. This is the supervised case. So this is the ideal. So this is the supervised case where different models are pre-trained with supervised learning. Uh, and this is the, the the approach of zero shot, I think. Yeah, so clip with zero shot. I think they use the, the best model, which is a vision transformer. <coughs> so the same model, they can indicate sample. So the same supervised uh, network that has 85% accuracy on ImageNet will score something like say 30 while the, the clip made model will score something like 70 so is this clear what this uh, graph on the left illustrates in a more quantitative and principled way or 
and the different points here are the different uh, resonance and vision transformers, but they are all trained with the same objective. So different architectures trained with CLIP, with the contrastive language image objective. Okay, now we'll talk about a completely new topic, which is called anomaly detection or visual anomaly detection. Do you have any questions regarding CLIP? No? Okay, good. Okay. So we'll see a new task. So far, we have discussed about um, image clustering, where we have some sort of a priori determined classes, like 100 or 2,000 or whatever. So for image, that's 1,000. And we try to find, we try to map or group the images into these 1,000 clusters without having paired label data, as in classification. So now we do something different. So now we do something different. This is a low dimensional feature representation. You can imagine this would be like a TSNE plot. And um, a model with a very good model would learn some sort of. Uh, so we imagine that there's some uh, some features, learn some learned features either from representation learning or supervised learning. We'll get more into that, and the model learns some sort of data representation. Uh, for the so here we don't have like a free training data distribution and uh, downstream data distribution. So this is the the training data we train the model. So let's forget for a moment that there's like a larger, large publicly available data. So let's say that these are the images that we have available, either if it's supervised or unsupervised. So these are representations from our images from a specific data set. Uh, in, in practice we will use uh, some uh, cipher, the cipher data sets, but you can imagine that this would be x-ray images from one hospital and that correspond to a specific modality from some specific company with some uh, carefully chosen parameters, for example, about the contrast of the image or uh, how the patient is centered and everything. And given these images that we have available, we, 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 we will call those images in distribution. Uh, I, I, use, I typically use this symbol. So take us in, in distribution. And we want to be able to detect so let's say we have a, a very, very good model for segmentation and classification. We want to be sure that this model is only dealt with images from the same hospital or in general from the same e-distribution. So we want to detect outliers before we actually feed the data in the classifier. Why? Because the model tends to to have maybe we have like some undesired behaviors. For example, if there is an, uh, a type of uh, X-ray image coming from another hospital, from another modality, probably from a different company with different settings, this would probably affect the the classifier that we have for the X-rays. Yes. Yeah, this is at the same time a good generalization of model, right? Yeah, but generalization is. Uh, really dependent on the scale, but there are like hundreds of applications where we don't have the scale. For example, in this application I'm talking about, you wouldn't have this uh, millions or billion of X-ray images. So you want to be able to detect images that are outliers, or even 
maybe somebody does like a mistake in a real life case and provides instead of a test x-ray uh, a knee x-ray for example and your classifier is dealt with completely uh, let's say wrong emails that has not been trained and you don't really want this outcome so this is like a, a task to detect anomalous samples or outliers or we will call them in general out of distribution samples so we want to detect uh, these samples I, the, the red ones on the block on the, on the board on the slide uh, which is the out distribution Okay, and we have three terms referring to the same task or out of distribution, where there is the abbreviation that I use OD, novelty detection or anomaly detection. So we try to identify samples that are probably outliers. Alright? This is the task. Let's see what we do about this. Um, and here there are some more general examples of different uh, sifts on the on the on the data distribution, like how the in distribution can be sifted to so that the samples are considered out of distribution. How different should we like? What is the threshold that the image is considered in and out distribution? And this can depend on the label sift or. Uh, if the, as I call it, a covariance shift, if the distribution changes. But not really important, we will predefine for you for, for the next task what would be the other distribution. So there was this guy in 2016 uh, from a lab, I think, in the US, in the US uh, who did some empirical observation, which was the beginning of all the literature that relates to OD or auto distribution detection. He said that given that we have a, a classifier so for now forget everything we've talked about about learned representation in the future. We have a classifier that is trained with uh, supervised learning on our domain of interest. It accepts images, text, whatever, it doesn't matter. We have C classes, and during test time, we have different. We have a probability distribution. We take the output, which is called logics, and then we apply software, and we get a, a probability distribution over these different classes, like how much this uh, image could be dog, cat, whatever. And he observed that uh, a very good indicator of the of classifying the images as in and out distribution was to use the maximum softmax probability which means not just taking the arc max for example it's like position 1, 0, 2, 3, 4 six. so during classification we say this is the highest probability this is position 3, position 3 corresponds to an airplane but instead we use the probability itself so let's say 0 0.8 And this has the abbreviation MSP, which refers to maximum softmax probability. Uh, and he observed that the, the in distribution samples, which I have here with the dots, or something close to dots, whatever, um, tend to have given that you do some supervised uh, training on the in distribution, the model tends to assign higher probabilities. Uh, imagine something like this ideally but not exactly like this in practice so this is like uh, so this is the maximum softmax probability from 0 to 1 and here you 
you take uh, a normalized histogram over all these values for all the different in distribution and out distribution. So this again from 0 to 1. Uh, okay, it's like a so if you integrate over all, all these, these the two different distributions, you get the uh, one. So then, so, so the in distribution samples tend to have like a much higher maximum softmax probability. Okay. Um, um, there is another score. So, so far, we assume that there is a classifier that is pre-trained with supervised uh, training and we take the maximum of probability. And later on, I think in 2018, uh, there was this, uh, another approach that uh, enables to define the score. So the score, uh, what is that? The score is responsible, sorry. the score is responsible for uh, defining a metric to classify these two uh, distributions. So we try to come up with metrics to define uh, these two distributions, to, to try to distinguish between those two distributions. So for example, these probabilities, if we take them, we can see that we can detect pretty much a lot of data that are in and out distribution. The alternative would be this Mahalanobis based score. Uh, this basically um, leverages the fact that uh, a supervised classifier tends to cluster images that belong to the same class together on the feature space and they form uh, something very close to a Gaussian distribution. So this is like uh, a way to fit this uh, multi this Gaussian distribution. So we fit a Gaussian distribution for each class. So if these are samples uh, contain, uh, contain, like samples containing class three, which can be like the dog, we leverage the fact that these are tend to be together by fitting a Gaussian distribution with a class-wise mean. So we only take those features and calculate the means, which is on the equation this mean of C. So this, each class has its own mean, so of course we need to know, we need supervised samples here to compute this mean. Um, and based on this mean and a, a shared variance between all those different clusters, so the shared variance is what they, what they sell is shared covariance matrix. So the, co the, co the covariance matrix from statistics is a, if we have like 200 dimensions, it's a 200 by 200 matrix, where 200 is like the, the feature dimension, and at each uh, position on its A, you can see the covariance between these two dimensions. Um, and then, instead of taking something as simple as a Mahalanobis uh, ma maximum so much probability, we instead, we instead uh, take uh, a distance, let's say, which is weighted in different ways based on these class-wise means and standard deviation and shared covariance. <coughs> uh, there is also this relative Mahalanobis distance we will not focus now, but let's say these two scores in the first in both cases, you need to have like a supervised classifier and take the maximum social probability. And in the second case, you need the, the supervised data to compute the means for each class. So in order to compute these class-wide means, you need to label the data. If you have no, uh, if the data are unlabeled, the alternative is uh, a very, very simple method that works quite well, is the nearest neighbors. So we use uh, the similarity between the, the training set. So here I haven't shown this, but this is like the, 
have only drawn the training set while in the, in the first slide, I think there is a definition between. So here the, the orange dots correspond to the in distribution training data, and the blue ones correspond to the in distribution test data. And we want to classify the blue ones as in distribution, while the red ones should be out of distribution. So the, the main, the bottom line uh, here is that instead of deciding for each sample independently, where we do its max, maximum soft function probability, uh, we move to the Mahalanobis distance, given that we have the labels, to take into account all the, the statistics of the, of the class, of the features of the class that have this mean. And if we have no information about the data whatsoever, we just uh, take the distance for each point, for example, uh, let's take this one. So let's use point O and point X. So we take the distance either so this is the in distribution data training data and these are two test samples I, I denote them with two different symbols so we take the distance to the nearest sample so the distance or similarity in practice <coughs> we use cosine similarity because everything is too normalized so you can imagine that these are the features from this SimCLR or MoCo or CLIP features that you have from some pre-training even training with self-supervised learning on the in-distribution just some features, learned features that have been learned during their presentation learning or pre-test task and we decide uh, on the we decide how much the data belong to the distribution based on these two distances. So with some threshold we decide which distance is, uh, is considered in distribution and out distribution. So we have these three basic scores, Mahalanob maximum softness probability, Mahalanobis distance and nearest neighbors. Uh, you can also here you can also take the average over all the training data. This is, we will just give the, the distance to the closest. And we want to basically decide how, what would be the metric. So for example, the metric, this is the score. Uh, the metric, for example, in image classification, is the accuracy. Uh, but in this task, we cannot directly define the accuracy, so we use some more sophisticated metrics. Uh, but in, in any case, uh, anomaly detection can be formulated as a binary classification task where the two classes are the in distribution or the anomalous samples so we can treat it as a binary classification task um, so this is the so called confusion matrix so for uh, predicted condition uh, is the, the columns and the rows correspond to the actual uh, the ground truth class. So we consider as positives the in distribution samples and as negatives the out of distribution samples. <coughs> and uh, in general, when you have binary classification, there are a lot of metrics that are defined for different applications based on. Uh, the different types of errors that you allow your classifier to make. But these are metrics are only viable for binary classification. In our case, we will use two important metrics, which the true positive rate, which is basically um, uh, this metric. So basically, given that the data are in distribution, how much did I get correctly? So we measure how many data we predict 
as mean distributions that are actually in distribution with respect to all the, the data that are P. So P positive samples. So given that we have 10,000 images that are in distribution, how many of them did we compute? Did we classify correctly? And the same thing for the false positive rate. Uh, ah, no, not the same, but given that uh, given that the data are in distribution, how much false positive? Yeah, here. So given that the data are anomalous, outliers, so out of distribution, how much of those data did we classify as in distribution? So you can imagine an example of uh, we need to accept some sort of threshold for each application. So you can imagine, for example, the, the different threshold in different applications with this, uh, for example, the, the COVID tests. How, with what probability should I accept a test, a COVID test to be positive or negative so that uh, I, I don't uh, let the, the, the virus spread out. So there probably you need a very, very high threshold while on, uh, on a segmentation model, even if it gets like a, a wrong input, you don't really, it doesn't really cost you so much in, in real life. So there is always some sort of threshold which is very hard to define and it's application dependent. So <coughs> uh, we would like to define some scores on this task that are a bit threshold independent. So for that, ah, here I also have like an illustration of uh, the true positive rate. You can imagine it as dividing all the sums that belong to the semicycle uh, with the ones that are belong to the left side of the image and the all positives similarly. And in our case, true positives are correctly classified in distribution samples. And false positives, with FB is the abbreviation, is out of distribution samples classified as in distribution. <coughs> so the same way that I, I said about the softmax probability, in any case we have like a scalar, which is a score, independent of the three scores that I talked about. We have a score, which is a scalar, and then you make a, a histogram of all these different scores. So you see, uh, let's say this is the in-distribution scores and this is the out-of-distribution scores. Uh, this um, yellow window is like the threshold where you have to accept how, how many erroneously classified samples can you withstand for your application. And uh, the score that we talk about uh, is based on the curve, which uh, you can imagine uh, us. So these are like the true positive samples. So you can imagine uh, us trying to plot uh, a graph uh, going from the true positives towards the false uh, negatives. So by moving around in this curve, we, we increase the ratio of true positives up until this point here, where we start to have the, the false negatives. I use the correct terminology? Yeah, false positives, sorry. So going from here and sliding through the threshold, we move on until this point where we have the first false positive. So the, the, the moment we move the threshold further up to this point, we start to accept some OD samples as in distribution because we, we have like a threshold here. So the, the rate of the false positive starts to go up. And then we have this point here where we have classified all the, all the in-distribution samples correctly. Uh, and no matter how much, no matter the threshold we might choose in the whole range, the number of true positives, so in distribution samples that are classified correctly, stays the same. 
and by sifting all these, these uh, uh, the, the threshold, by sifting all the different thresholds, we get uh, the so-called uh, receiver operating curve. So again, try to imagine uh, having a threshold going from here to, to here. Maybe you can draw that on the board if you want. <coughs> so in the beginning, you have zero false positive and true positive. And yeah, I think it's better to draw. Quite tricky to understand. So we have the true positive and four positive rates. And in the beginning, uh, all the images, imagine this plot, all the images that I'm classifying are correctly classified up until this point where I'm hitting this, uh, this point, which is like the, where I start to having like this false uh, false positives and here I go on this side so here I accepted one sample that is uh, false positive but at the same time I'm also accepting more uh, in distribution samples so this curve would probably look like that This point, you can imagine it as the last point here, where I accepted all the true positives from the distribution. And, and uh, I cannot go higher on the, I have classified all the, the distributions. So then, So this is the connection between this plot on the slides and the arrow C curve, receiver operating curve, uh, a bit more clear. W what does it happen? So it's, it's a, a graph that is threshold independent. So basically we consider all the different thresholds based on the application. So the applications define what is this threshold between 0 and 1. And for different applications, you define uh, different uh, false positive rates that will influence also the true positive rate. So it's like a, a trade-off that you have to do if you work on some real-life projects. <coughs> Any questions? No? Okay. Um, yeah, this is the discretized version that I showed you, uh, which you have to move for each, for each sample. But for a very large number of samples, this becomes more smooth, something like something like this. So the advantages of this curve is that it's threshold independent, and uh, the since we want to have like one quantitative metric like accuracy in image specification we compute all the area under this ROC curve and this is the metric that's called ROC and this is the area under the receiver operating curve yes? when you say threshold independent is that because it takes into consideration all the possible thresholds. Yes, yes, we kind of take into account all the possible thresholds and we kind of make it threshold independent, but just a, a, value, a score, like a trick. It's also 
quite insensitive to the class imbalance because as we've shown the, on the two, uh, let's say, distributions, independently you could have 100 samples or 10 million samples. We just, te we just take into account how these are distributed. So the more samples you have, the more representative this distribution would look like. But our score takes into account the data as a probability distribution. That's why we say that it's more uh, insensitive to the class imbalance. And the interpretation is how... Um, okay, I destroyed the plot. But the, the main interpretation is how far from a random classifier you, you are at each point in this graph. So the random classifier, for the random classifier, because you pick like randomly consider its data as in distribution or out distribution, you always move on the diagonal. So from this point to this point, if there are 10 samples, you identify five of them as in distribution, five of them as out distribution. Uh, and the main interpretation is that we want to be as far as possible from the random classifier. And, and uh, a perfect classifier would go only up here, so two positives all the time, and then you would reach point 0.1. Okay, some people draw this line as well, but it doesn't really matter. So you have to understand that a perfect classifier would never score a false positive, so it would never classify out of distribution data as in distribution, so it would only go up. That's why you see this dot on the upper left part for the perfect classifier. Okay, I need five more minutes. So, but these are the main things you need to do to work with anomaly detection. So I have a lot of slides how people used to do that. Uh, so in the supervised case, we have the maximum softmax probability and Mahalanobis distance over the features. Uh, but we will work on the last case, which is uh, supervise all the detection with these click-based models, because we want to show you the, the applicability of those representations. So this is a, an example, very quickly, of uh, a, a pre-trained model with self-supervised learning of any distribution. I think this is cipher 10 or something. Here you can see this visualization that I showed on the blackboard on these different classes of the distribution, like cat, cats, trucks, airplanes, dogs, whatever. Here is the cosine similarities. Uh, so basically these two histograms, so they are not normalized, but you can normalize it with the max to, to make it from zero to one. So these two histograms uh, is, uh, indicate how much the e-distribution are close to the day distribution test set. So here it's just a test set but the nearest neighbor is computed over the in-distribution training set. <coughs> and you can see that the more far away these two histograms are from each other, the, the better the OOD classification. The, the more we can identify, the more we can distinguish between these two binary classes in or out distribution. Another very important plot uh, which was from a paper from 2021 is that uh, uh, so this is like a PCA PCA is like a low dimensional projection of the features so they show that if you take uh, if you train a, a supervised model from scratch or your in on your in-distribution data directly it doesn't lead to very well separated classes uh, as much as if you train on a bigger large scale data set like ImageNet. So here are the features again from the same Cypher 100 data set, but pre trained on a larger data set, which is ImageNet. So this is a vision transformer pre trained on ImageNet, but the features are on Cypher 100. And they show that the, the clusters are very well separated. 
and the better, the, the more well separated are the clusters, the more likely is that you have a very good out of distribution detector. This is something experimental, not very really justified whatsoever. And in the third case, they take this model and they perform additional fine tuning, as we would say, like supervised fine tuning of those models, uh, specifically for the in distribution. So fine tuning directly on Cypher 100. And they showed, at least visually and experimentally, that the the model uh, that supervised fine tuning enables us to tighten these clusters from the in distribution, and as a result, to have like a better detector. So pre-trained models have this is supervised pre-trained models, but there are pre-trained models have learned have helped us a lot to start from a, a very good feature space and then do stuff on top to get even uh, more tight clusters. But the next, the next question would be how would you, would you work and improve the feature spaces if you don't have sample, uh, labeled samples? So from supervised OD detection that you tighten the clusters to unsupervised, which is what we will do using the clip models and the text encoder on the next exercise. So this is just some quantification from the results. <coughs> um, so the, the two main questions to finish the lecture would be given a pre-trained model, like a visual pre-trained model, what, how can we define the OD score? The answer is you take the distances or the cosine similarity between, let's say, the closest uh, in distribution training set and this is the score and then you compute the different metrics so it's number one and number two is that uh, that you will see in depth in the exercise uh, that these clip models because they are trained with text are really reliable all the detectors even though they are pre-trained on larger data set and we have worked a lot in the lab uh, with different techniques and evaluation as to how to leverage these models to the maximum based uh, on the different cases. So if you, be, if you are completely unsupervised, you have, no, you have some distribution data but you don't know their labels. So there we take these one nearest neighbors on the picture space on the, from each test data to the distribution. The second block of approach is, is whether you have unlabeled in distribution data, but you have the label names for the in distribution. And then you can use this, uh, you can leverage the text encoder from clip and do these three different approaches that we will discuss, you will see on the exercise. Uh, so, for example, the first one is called pseudo labels maximum softmax probability. It's very simple. You take the distribution class names, you produce their uh, text or sentence representation, and you map your image from the train encoder, and you take this uh, as the desired class. So basically, the same way you would do zero shot image classification. You can, do that. you can directly do um, OD detection using the maximum softmax probability over the emails, over the different text, texts that correspond to different classes. And in the last case, we show that you don't need to fine tune the whole network, the whole visual backbone, which could even be a billion parameter model. You could just either use the Mahalanobis distance directly or a variation of the Mahalanobis distance that you will see probably in the exercise that's called relative Mahalanobis distance. Uh, and uh, you could also, and, and another thing we saw is that you could use the, you could only do linear probing instead of training the whole, instead of fine tuning the whole billion parameter models and get state of the art uh, results 
cause of distribution detection. Um, and the last thing we have already shown, we have, we have seen, is um, how different pre-trainings and models scale with respect to not scale, how the different um, so before these guys from 2021 saw that these tight that these tight clusters which lead to a very good in distribution classifier, either with K nearest neighbors, linear probing, fine-tuning. They show that the more tight the clusters, the better the in-distribution accuracy and the better the out-of-distribution detection. And they show this uh, linear behavior in the supervised case where you have the labels to train this in-distribution classifier. And we even saw this, this uh, assumption is true for natural images even without any tuning. So here we have a K and then a detector to so decide on the class based on the 20 nearest neighbors for all the in-distribution data. And here we have the outrock of the nearest neighbor similar. So that the nearest neighbor similarity we use it as an OD score. And we show that this idea, this linear behavior is even true when you don't do any task specific fine tuning on the on the distribution. So it's a very important uh, finding. That's it for today. Sorry for the delay.